All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from Atlanta, Georgia by Dave Kirchen. How are you doing, David Kirchen? How are you doing? Hey, John, doing well. Thank you. Yeah, and David's a 35-year sales veteran with success in companies such as Bell South and Career Builder. You were actually educated as an engineer and then discovered the secrets of sales success by exploring behavioral psychology and the science of human decision making. And in 2012, you founded Master Messaging to help clients increase revenue by mastering the ability to elevate their value. And your new book is 6X, Convert More Prospects to Customers. And what we're going to talk about today is the uh, three sins of selling, three mistakes not to make and, and ruin your ruin your pipeline. So um, let's get let's get straight into it, Dave. Before we go into the three mistakes, just give me the genesis of the book. Like what 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 drove you to write the the, the book? Yeah, really what's behind it is in uh, 11 years of working with over 200 different companies and helping them elevate the value of their product or service in the conversations that they're having. Uh, what I experienced was that the, the challenges usually show up in the first couple of conversations. Most sales professionals uh, have a deep understanding and passion for the product or service that they sell. And so they don't have a problem talking about uh, what it is or what it does. The challenge with that is in the early stage conversations, if there's too much of a heavy emphasis on what the product is and does, mm -hmm. the prospect gets confused and there may not be additional conversations. So that's what led us to focusing specifically on discovery calls, demonstrations, again, those things that are happening early in the relationship with the prospect. And again, as you rightly uh, communicated just a minute ago, uh, never wanted to be in a position where I'd have an accomplished sales professional ask me, hey, why should I do what you're telling me to do and not have a substantial answer to it? Which is why I read over 20 books on behavioral psychology to really get a grasp and an understanding around what's going on in a price prospect's head when they're trying to make a buying decision and as these words are flying out of a salesperson's mouth. So that's what led to that, uh, really to the content in the book. And the six X, that actually came from the results that we got with our uh, first client that we built a playbook for around those early conversations. Their conversion rate was a horrible 8%. Mm -hmm. So eight out of 100 uh, prospects in that first discovery call went on to the next stage. By using the principles that we incorporated into a very custom playbook for their reps, after one quarter, their conversion rates were at 47%. Wow. So they saw a 6x return uh, on the uh, results that they were getting in those early stage conversations. Fantastic. Well, let's get into the three mistakes, because you said there are some basic mistakes that people make that derail them, even at the very beginning of the of the sales cycle, even at the beginning of their conversations. So what, what's the what's the first mistake that you see often salespeople make? You know, the, the first one's interesting. It's uh, sales professionals have a tendency to share way too much information. And there's, there's actually a, 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 a biological reason for that. Uh, as human beings, when we meet somebody for the very first time, mm -hmm. we're most comfortable and confident when we're talking about something that we're knowledgeable about or passionate about. Mm -hmm. Obviously for most sales reps, that would be the product or service that they represent. So here's what's happening. They meet somebody for the first time. It could be in a Zoom call, it could be in person, and they have a sense of, hey, this person's interested in my product. And so they start talking about what it is and does. And they think that it's just so amazing and so compelling that if they just share a bunch of information of what it is and does, that prospects will raise their hand and say, I'll take five. Mm -hmm. um, and you and I, John, know that's not the way it works. Uh, biologically, here's what's happening, though. Dopamine is dripping on their brain as they talk about things that they're passionate mm. about. So it's a feel-good hormone. So it causes us to feel good and comfortable when we're talking about these things about our product, which can lead us to sharing way too much information. And mm -hmm. here's, here's the central challenge to that. Human beings are only able to remember so much. And if there's two or three things that a salesperson really wants to focus the conversation on, their unique value, if there's two or three things that are really important in the conversation, in the volume of information, those important things get lost. Mm. 
And so what happens is it muddies the conversation in a way where the prospect doesn't remember the benefit or the value for them because there was just way too much information being shared around it. Yeah. And sometimes I think, uh, and I'd love to get your insight on this, I think part of it is that in an, in an initial call, but this happens in a lot of calls, is that salespeople are afraid of silence. They're afraid of pauses. They're afraid of giving. And, and sometimes, you know, when you, as you said, I mean, if you're asking good questions and listening and trying to draw out information from the other person and make it about them, uh, you also got to give them the opportunity to think for a moment before they answer your question. And I feel like we just get so hyped up that we dive in, you know, we kill any silence because we're afraid of it. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. But here's the other benefit of silence. Mm -hmm. If there's a little bit of silence before you share something compelling and interesting, that silence actually puts more value oh, on what point. it is that you're getting ready to share. Wow. That's a, I, 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 that's actually excellent. Uh, that's one I hadn't heard before. So there's two benefits to it there. Exactly. I mean, you, a little pause before you build it up and a, a pause to allow, if you ask a question, like allow the person to actually think about it and mm -hmm. allow them to build on it. Because sometimes they give you an answer and then you go, well, is, is that it? You know, is there more and let them build on it. And I think that's, that's, that's part of it. And, and like I, you were saying, like, it's good to be confident and enthusiastic but you have to be controlled as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it, again, we, we eat, live and breathe the products and services that we represent. So it's only natural that there's going to be that passion that comes out of it. You just have to be self-aware and knowing, hey, this dopamine is creating a drug induced feature dump. I need to reel that in and just focus the conversation on what I know to be important to the person that I'm trying to build a relationship with. Absolutely. So that's excellent. So what's the what's the second, uh, the next uh, mistake that you see salespeople make? This is this is one of my favorite. Um, nothing unique showing up in the conversation. Mm. Now, uniqueness is important in two areas. The first is pretty obvious. You want to focus the converse, conversation around your unique ability to solve the problem for the prospect that you're having a conversation with. Obviously, that's a given. Yep. So you want to identify that uniqueness. Um, and as you're doing that, I know there are going to be listeners to your podcast that are going to be sitting there going, wait, I work for a commoditized company. Yep. Maybe it's the cellular in industry or telecommunications. Mm -hmm. Or again, there are a number of companies that have a, a bevy of competitors. Yep. And it, you may look at that and go, well, there's nothing really unique to what I do. Here's, here's a trick that um, uh, your listeners can take advantage of. Let's... Um, Let's look at chocolate. Most people wouldn't think that chocolate is unique. Sure, you can get unique variations of it, but mm -hmm. chocolate in and of itself is somewhat of a commodity. Same thing's true with peanut butter. Peanut butter is fairly uh, commoditized. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you bring chocolate and peanut butter and you bring them together? Reese's peanut butter cups, right? very unique. Mm -hmm. Or I was doing a workshop in uh, London a couple of weeks ago and they immediately said Nutella. And I was like, <laughs> there you I go. thought of Nutella, but yes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uniqueness shows up in a combination of things. Uh, it may be an element that your competitors do, but they don't have uh, the combination of two elements. And you can focus uh, your conversation around the combined value and the combined uniqueness of something in your product or service. So that's the first element of uniqueness. Mm -hmm. The other one. I think a lot of sales professionals don't really pay attention to, and that's the uniqueness of the way that you communicate the value of your product or service. So think about the typical prospect in today's world. If they have three or four companies that they want to vet uh, in solving a problem inside of their business, mm -hmm. uh, just imagine the, the prospects world. Zoom call number one, Zoom call number two, Zoom call number three. Zoom call number four. At the end of the day, that prospect is sitting there. I am so tired of Zoom, PowerPoint, people yep. presenting to me. This is boring. This, this is horrible. Sales professionals have an opportunity uh, uh, to communicate in a way that's compelling and unique. In today's world, one of those ways could be whiteboarding. Yeah. Just a simple thing like taking advantage of the whiteboard capability inside of Zoom or Teams. Every time I have a conversation with a sales leader about the value that we can bring to their sales team, I whiteboard. 
Right. And without fail, at the end of the call, 95% of the time, that sales leader will look at me and go, hey, David, can you teach my salespeople to do what you just did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the reason that they're saying that is because it's unique and different. Mm -hmm. And the, the value of uniqueness is this. Our brains are designed and hardwired to find things that stand out as being different. Yep. And not only are they hardwired to, to pay attention to those things, but because they're paying attention to it, they also remember it. And mm -hmm. so for sales professionals, they have this ability and this opportunity to embrace their profession and find unique and creative ways yeah. to communicate with another human being that will be memorable and stand out in a way that the prospect will be like, I want to do business with that person just because of the way that they communicated with me. Yeah. And by the way, the, um, the, the great news about what you just outlined there is that unfortunately, so many people are doing it in exactly the same fashion as everybody else mm -hmm. that if you do start, as you said, if you do start to pull up a whiteboard, if you do add in a little bit of a different element, you're going to stand out and you're going to be memorable. So it's like the bar is not even set that high <laughs> right now because people are so used to a kind of like generic experience. So anything you add to that is going to make you stand out. So a little bit of thought can go an awful long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my favorite uh, things as, as far as uniqueness showed up in a, uh, a convention that I recently attended. Uh, one of my larger clients is a, uh, a large floor covering fr uh, franchise here in North America. And so I was at the International Franchise Association uh, and I was in a booth with a, a company that does digital marketing. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I love to do at, at trade shows is just walk into a booth and go, pitch me, <laughs> I, yeah. you know, tell me what you got. And so I'm walking, I'm watching these two guys and uh, they're in their booth and they're handing out koozies. And so I walked up to them and I said, why are you handing out koozies? And they thought, well, that's what you do at trade shows. You yeah. hand out Chotskys and it has your right. name and number on it. And I said, so yeah. let me get this straight. You think somebody's going to take your koozie, put it on a cold drink, and one day they're going to look at your company name and phone number and they're going to go, I need to call these guys. <laughs> and they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to come back to the question. Why are you handing out the koozies? I said, so what if you did this instead? I said, what's the key value you bring to a franchise? And they said, efficiency. I said, okay. I said, watch this. So I waited for the next person to walk down the aisle and I picked up a koozie and I stood in front of them and I said, hey, can I tell you an interesting story about this koozie? And the person was like, well, well sure. I said, you know, this thing was created for a very specific reason. When you're drinking a, a soft drink or a cold drink, mm -hmm. The way that that, that uh, container is created, it's not very uh, efficient. And so the uh, coolness is going to dissipate and it's going to turn warm. So there's some inefficiency there. What the koozie does is it makes that experience more efficient because it's going to extend the amount of time that you can experience a cool drink. Mm -hmm. That efficiency is the same thing that this company right over here brings to franchises like yours. You should have a conversation with them. Right. So I walked them into the booth and the two young sales guys were standing there like, I, I don't even know what you just did. And I, they said, well, how do, you, how do you do that? And I said, well, you know, go to my website, buy my book. There's a lot of good stuff in there yeah. about being unique, but just tell a story around a 3D object that anchors your value. Because guess what the, uh, the people that get those koozies that have been told that story to, guess what they're going to think of the next time they yeah, see a koozie? Yeah. They're going to think, uh, they're, exactly. They're going to think of, of you, well, they're going to think of you or they're going to think of that company, but they're also quite likely to go to, the, they're sitting around the barbecue with their friends going, what, do, what does this koozie do? <laughs> right. Let me tell you, it's an efficiency. It's an efficiency enhancer. So, yeah. I mean, you're going to get that knock on too because you because it was unique. But I mean, I love that because you, and I agree with you. I mean, you know, I, I worked at one place where the CEO, even though he was ex extremely wealthy, used to just go around the conference halls at all conferences, uh, just collecting freebies from everybody. <laughs> and your point is like, some people just give it to you and there's nothing behind it. And what you just did was just say here, now the koozie, it's not a koozie, it's a sales tool. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, that's just another example of, mm. Um, giving some thought to how can I communicate the value of the product or service that I represent in a unique way so that it'll be memorable. And mm -hmm. again, so that I'll stand out from all the other competition.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's like that old saying, what was it I was doing recently, you know, that one about, uh, here's a here's a pen, can you sell me this pen? And the actual answer is, uh, well, I don't know whether you need a pen yet. That's the right answer rather than like, you know, go into, well, this is a great pen. <laughs> right. I just go the reason I thought that was brilliant, you know, that the correct answer is not to sell the pen is to actually ask you whether you need a pen or not. Right, right. <laughs> is there a problem to solve? Yeah. 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 So, um, so let's move on to number three. Yeah. So number three, um, this is a tough one uh, for salespeople to overcome. And that is the conversation ends up being all about them or the company or product that they represent. Mm -hmm. One of the, uh, one of the things that we ask of our clients when we first start working with them is send us your sales deck. In other words, what is it that the sales team members are using in the conversations they're having with prospects? And John, without fail, the first two or three slides are yep. all about the company. Yep. We've been in business for 10 years. We have world-class customer service. Yep. Uh, we you know, have offices all over the globe. We do business with 90% of the Fortune 2000 companies. Yeah. And here's all, a bunch of logos to look at. Yeah, it's all we, 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 and I, I, I. Mm -hmm. And what sales professionals need to understand is that the person that you're having a conversation with doesn't care about any of that. Mm -hmm. They care yeah. about them. And so the other uh, place where the focus is all on the salesperson actually comes back to the intent that they're bringing to the relationship. Yeah. I mean, how many times, John, in your own life, in your own business, have you experienced a sales professional sitting across the desk from you? And you can tell they're not even making eye contact with you. They see dollar signs dancing over your head <laughs> and they're trying to figure out how do I get those dollar signs into my back pocket? Yep. Yep. That's their intent. Their intent is all about them. It's a selfish motivation, which is why in a Gallup poll several years ago, uh, they were asking about the uh, moral relevancy of about 44 different professions in mm -hmm. the business world. Where do you think sales came out? <laughs> 45th. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Actually, it was it was 43 out of 44. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was always going to be 45 out of 44. <laughs> I can't remember. It was either stockbrokers or lawyers that were. Oh. But the reason for that, that people associate the sales profession yeah. as not morally relevant is because of sales professionals behaving badly and with the wrong intent. Yeah, exactly. They're interacting with a prospect in a way. Hey, I got a great deal. It's only good until five o'clock today. Or, you know, just think about the myriad of tricks and maneuvers that salespeople uh, and, use to, yeah, to and, try and create an artificial inducement to, to create yeah. a sale. And here's the thing is like all the surveys and everything nowadays are just saying that people want to be seen, heard and understood. Right. And if you're just bombarding them, you're not doing any of those. You're not seeing them. You're not hearing them and you're not understanding them. Um, back when I ran uh, Hathaway, it was a sales consultancy. What we used to do, Dave, is just, David, is just something for unique is when we go into a presentation, you know, we wouldn't start off with the deck you're talking about. We would actually either stand up with a flip chart or a whiteboard and say and start off by here's what we understand about you. And we would write it all down and we would understand here's the issues that you're having. Please, are these correct? We want and it and it's such a different experience, right? When you yeah. started off completely focused on and sort of saying, I want, we want to make sure that we understand you so we can make this meeting productive. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that's so important. Um, here's the challenge for sales professional. Actually, it's, it's a challenge for a human being, period. <laughs> from the time that we could walk around on this planet, we've been conditioned to look at the world from our point of view. This, yep. this is my worldview. This is what goes into it. My experience, my family, my friends, the culture that I live in, this has created my worldview. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to shift from your point of view and your worldview to looking at the worldview of the person that you're trying to build a relationship with. Yeah. And so one of the techniques that you can use to do that is a very simple technique called you phrasing. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying I and we, and this is what you tapped into just in the way that you would kick off a sales yeah. call, instead of saying I and we, say something like, hey, what you're going to experience today is, yeah, or what you're going to see, instead of saying I'm going to show you or I'm going to conduct, by putting you in the front part of the sentence, it's causing you 
to look at this person from their point of view, mm -hmm. but it's also engaging the person that you're having a conversation with because their brain registers, hey, pay attention. David's right. talking about you. You need to listen to what he's saying instead yeah. of using I and we. And I and we, it can be confusing. Like the time that I was you know, lying in my hospital bed after getting knee surgery in my 20s, the uh, physician orthopedist walks into the room and goes, how are we doing today? <laughs> And I looked at him, I said, there's no we. No, there's no we. I'm sitting here in this morphine pump for everything it's worth. I'm in pain. You're walking around fine. We're not a we yet. That's too presumptive. And so yeah. that can happen as well. In a selling conversation, you may say we, and, and the person you're talking with is like, I'm not sure we're at that point in our relationship yet. Yeah, no, exa exactly. Or you might say, well, who else are you referring to? Who, who's behind you? <laughs> <laughs> Who else is on this call that I don't know about? Yeah. But it's great. It's a great point. And you know, Dave, Dave what I love about this and, and everything you've outlined today is that it's simple. Now, simple doesn't equate to easy. Mm -hmm. We know that because it may be simple to understand and simple, but the the part is actually practicing it and embedding it and doing it uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so these are fantastic. What you've outlined today is fantastic. Like all of David's information is going to be below this video and linked to the book. But before we go, David, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah. So uh, Master Messaging is a sales consultancy that helps uh, sales professionals and sales organizations elevate the perceived value of the product or service that they represent in the selling conversations that they're having. And the way that we do that is that we create a custom program for every one of our clients in the form of a sales playbook. Uh, that playbook gives examples of what those conversations would look like for specific, specific personas and yep. industries that they would be communicating with. Uh, and so that we do that in a series of workshops, either in person or, or via Zoom, and then also uh, provide ongoing coaching to reinforce the principles and techniques that they learn in the uh, workshops. Excellent. Well, I would encourage people go check it out because I mean, this is as you've seen from what David has outlined today, this is practical advice. It's things that you can implement. As I said, they're, they're simple, doesn't mean that it's easy, but they're simple to understand and to uh, and to implement. And then you just have to, you know, focus on doing it on a regular basis and embedding it in into your daily work practice. So I would very much encourage you, hey, make life easier for yourself. Seriously. If you're not having a good time, if sales aren't good, like go, go educate yourself and don't wait around. I'm just gonna say one more thing to everyone. Don't wait around for your company to educate you or to train you. Go train yourself because nobody yeah. cares about your success as much as you do. Good stuff, John. All right. Listen, thanks again, David. Thank you for watching and listening and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.